just does anybody yeah does anybody else have any just a, you know a couple of lines about what yesterday um meant to them and and what they're hoping for from today as well So, I found yesterday quite inspirational. I think I said yesterday that it's about this mutual support is not just about learning from each other. Whilst there is a lot of that, for me, it's about realising that um, you're not thinking ridiculous things and that lots of other people are on the same page as you and that there's a, a, um, a momentum building. And I, I, I found that, that really great. I'm going to have to dip in and out today, but... Um, but I'm hoping that, you know, um, that we get some nuggets of ideas um, that, talk, that as we did yesterday and things that we can practically take forward um, and just understanding where everybody else is on this um, challenging journey. Yeah, thank you. OK, Susie, do you want to uh, take it from here? Yes, sorry, I just lost my, lost my controllers. Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for having me. Um, great to be here. I wasn't, I'm in the middle of moving house, so I wasn't able to join yesterday, but it sounds like it was great. And I saw some stuff on Twitter, which looked like it was going really well. So I'm sure it was. And hopefully, hopefully I can add to that. Um, so yeah, I'm from Power to Change. And I have got some slides to run through with you all, but then I just want to open up into a chat really at the end. Um, so it's not going to be me just kind of talking at you for ages. So I will hopefully work out how to share my screen, but I never managed to do it properly the first time. Where's the share screen? Oh, there. Here we go. What are you seeing now? Is it presentation? Good. I will go into slideshow. There we go. Hopefully that's what you can see. Real good? Excellent. Yeah. Um, so yes, I'm, I'm Susie from Power to Change. I'm now, my title has changed slightly, but I'm now Market Opportunities Manager. Um, and I know some of you will be quite familiar with Power to Change, but other you, others of you might not. And we've been supporting Con Valley on this journey in a couple of different ways, but, but really excited to kind of be a part of this, this kind of learning. And I think it's really nice that you're all talking about it as mutual learning. I think that's, that was something that really excited us about this particular part of the project um, when, when we were approached and started talking to you guys. So we're, we're Power to Change and we are the trust that supports community businesses in England. Um, and we help those communities to use kind of shared power and, and business and kind of trading industry to transform where they live. Um, we've recently just launched our new strategy, so it was only a couple of weeks ago, um, and that's our new strategic plan from 21 to 25. Um, and our, our vision is powerful communities, better places. And it's really about kind of strengthening community businesses in order that they can create powerful communities, better places. And so the changes that we want to see in the world are about improved capabilities in community businesses, more community businesses, better funding and support into them, new and diverse communities participating in them, more assets owned by communities, and also community businesses developing locally led solutions to net zero or working towards net zero. So that's our new strategy. Um, I probably wouldn't normally have put our strategy in, but it, it will be new to some of you, I'm sure, from what we've kind of had a slight shift recently. Um, so just wanted to talk through it. So I think these our strategic priorities are the things that kind of I think sit really well with what Con Valley is doing and what a lot of the other organisations that you've had in and are having later today and to talk about are, are really kind of trying to work towards and there's a real, real alliance between, between the kind of ethics at the heart of it, I think. So community business is at the heart of a fairer economy. So we really want to, in the future, really push towards the idea that community and collective ownership is this really about fair economies and equally shared economies and inclusive economies. They're more resilient as organisations, you know, we've seen through the pandemic that they're enormously flexible and rapid to change and responsive to the needs and the strengths of their communities. We need to make sure that they're resilient and able to weather future storms that come. But also that they're more diverse, equitable and inclusive. We know we've got work to do and we are actively trying to do that, but we know we're not there yet. 
Um, so that is one of our focuses, is really trying to work on how we can make a more equitable and inclusive sector. Um, so for those of you who don't know, what is a community business? Um, it's a locally rooted organisation, so it's, it's in a place and that the size of that place might vary. Uh, in a really big urban area, it's likely to be a small kind of neighbourhood scale, although that might vary depending on the types of stuff that the organisation does. They trade in some way. They don't have to trade to generate all their income. Obviously, we give out grants, so there is a mix of income that we anticipate organisations having. Um, but they trade in some way to achieve sustainability. So that could be selling goods or services or a combination of, of both. But again, they can have kind of a mixed income streams and they deliver community wide impact. So that doesn't mean everything they do is open to everyone from the community because that probably isn't appropriate. But it means that they kind of have a bit of an open door approach and they are they're accessible to almost everyone in the community. And, and crucially, they're kind of accountable to their community their local community in some way and I think you know Con Valley those of you who are here know what Con Valley do it's a really really good kind of example about that in terms of in terms of the membership model um, and I think kind of that the actual real kind of another bit is they're kind of of a place rather than just in it they really belong to the place that they're from um, so in terms of, of community business impact across the board so community businesses can be anything from a community owned pub when the local pub's closing down and people want to take it over through to, you know, we've supported a lobster hatchery, we've supported solar farms, so all sorts of things. They can be anything, it's just that they have to kind of hold those, those tenants really hot, close to their, their operating approach. And they have this variety of impacts. So they reduce social isolation, they bring people together, they improve health and well-being. And these are across the board. So all sorts of community businesses have these impacts. Um, and this all contributes to those things that we were talking about previously around kind of fairer economies, better places, resilient communities. At our last, um, our last community business market survey was last year, um, and this, this may have changed by now. We don't yet know the full impact of the pandemic on the scale of the sector, um, but there were over 11,000 in England. And, and we operate only across England, so there's over 11,000 community businesses in England. So very small part of the overall business market, but growing and quite sizable in terms of, of social enterprise and that kind of trading model uh, of charitable and um, social impact organisations. They employ quite a lot of people, a lot of volunteers. And, and I think one of the really interesting things is they, they own £870 million worth of assets in the community business market, which is really interesting and it's really exciting because it's one of the things that quite often gives different types of community businesses a bit of sustainability, depending on what it is that their core business model is. I'll skip. So community business and social care. So we, we actually clump together health and social care as one. Um, and that's a historic thing. So it doesn't, doesn't make talking about social care separately particularly easy, but there are, there are over 400 organisations that we know of that are health or, health or care community businesses. Um, they generate 123 million um, in income a year and they employ the most staff for community business sector and they deliver regulated and non-regulated non provision. Um, and it's the largest medium income generator per kind of per community business sector as we we describe it. So it really is a big part of the community business market. And the social care section of that in particular is still quite nascent. It is still new. And I think that's why this work is really exciting and really valuable because it's new and it, it's still a bit risky. And that being able to share that learning as you're generating it is gonna be so supportive to other organizations and other places that wanna go through this because it is so nascent. In terms of social care provision, there, there are a mix of uh, models that community businesses take. Um, so there's obviously Cold Valley, but the, there's kind of that regulated, non-regulated. There's a range of approaches. So there's introductory agencies that really act to connect people who, people who are in need of some support with people who are able to offer support locally. There's direct provision, the supported activities, so a whole range of different things. And they're also gaining income from a range of different places. So personal budgets, in ISFs, contracts, self-funders. So there's a whole range of different opportunities there for social care provision within that kind of collective ownership market. 
Um, and I wanted to talk about another example that I actually don't know if, if they're featured in this at all, so sorry if you've heard from them. So Ned Clare in North East Dartmoor, which started from kind of a threat to local services. So there was a cottage hospital locally that was going to be closed down, um, and the, the validation for that was that there was plenty of social care locally, so it didn't matter. People would still be able to get the support that they and, and local people knew that wasn't the case. So they came together to really try and create something to fill that gap and to be able to provide good support to people locally when that cottage hospital closed. So it started as a community owned introductory agency, it grew, it got CPC regulated, and now it works as a kind of self-managed team. And they've also developed a, a kind of plat an online platform to, to do that introductory agency piece, but they also have kind of direct provision. Um, and what they're doing really interestingly is, and I think this is this is one of the things that comes through with, with the kind of community business collective ownership ethos across the board, is that reinvesting surplus into other stuff. So it's not siphoned off, it's reinvested into other local stuff. So they've, they've got this four by four volunteer force. So they're out on Dartmoor and the weather gets pretty bad sometimes. And not only does that help that their care workforce get to work and go and see different people when they need it, but they can also get support out to other people who might need it or might need help getting to work. So it's about that kind of bigger impact. And I think that's something that we see across the board with community businesses in the sector. Um, one of the other examples I wanted to give, and it is slightly different, it's not that kind of direct provision of CQC regulated domiciliary care, but it's a lot of the organisations that we see that come through that are working in the kind of adult social care space deliver kind of support to people with learning disabilities, so working age adults with learning disabilities um, and other, other support needs. And so the befriending scheme in Suffolk is a, is a care farm. And so we actually get quite a few care farms that we've supported or that we, we're aware of as community businesses. And so they, they offer a whole range of different things. So as a community owned farm, they provide growing opportunities, they provide volunteering opportunities, they'll support people towards employment if that's the right approach for that individual. Um, and what that does, it has a really positive impact on health and well-being. it has a positive impact on kind of education, development, training, and most of that income is generated through personal budget. So I think it's just, it's really interesting, there are different, different approaches to social care from the kind of community collective ownership side of things. So why does it matter? Because I think that's, that's one of the kind of most interesting things about this. So it does for the people receiving support. I think it really does. And I'm sure, I'm sure Veronica and the team have talked about this quite a lot, um, that the people receiving support, you know, they have actual ownership over the organisation that is providing them with support. And I think there's very few times in life we can say that. And we have a stake in the thing that is providing us a service. And I think that that is one of the really exciting things and the, the really kind of crucial parts of this. But also it comes with all that kind of personalization and all the other things that make good care. Um, and that broader connection to community. And I know I know the Calm Valley team will have talked about this, but in, in the other examples, it's there as well, that it's not go in, provide care, leave. It's really about connecting people into their communities if that's what they want. Um, and then there's the people delivering the support that they have a, an ownership. Um, they have good working conditions, they have development opportunities where appropriate, and, and that real striving to provide the people who are delivering that support with a good, a good employment opportunity. There's the impact on local economies, so this is a, something that's really important as well. So instead of being extractive, community businesses, for every pound that is spent, 56 pence stays local. Um, from our latest research on that, we don't know how much that's changed again, but that, and I think that's really important. It's one of the, the really strong kind of financial arguments around this stuff is really actually this is keeping money in the local economy. Um, the impact on the environment, if it is locally owned and depending on the setup of the model, you know, if you have self-managed teams in small places, then people are traveling less far. So the impact on the environment is instantly lower. So I recently speaking to a local authority and they've done done an internal kind of carbon footprint baselining and the adult social care department had the biggest carbon footprint because of course it did because they had people driving all across the place to deliver very short appointments to then drive somewhere else and deliver another very short appointment and actually if you have local local delivery and that doesn't mean it has to be collective ownership but local delivery the impact on the environment is going to be lower 
but also this kind of broader community. And I think quite often we're all disconnected from local care provision if you're not actively involved in it. But you can connect people back into their communities, which brings the broader community into connect, connection and kind of engagement with them, which I think is one of the real, real in positive impacts of, of collective ownership in the care space. I wanted to talk briefly, and I think it's not, it doesn't necessarily fit at this point, but from local authorities are crucial in social care. As we know, they are one of the kind of, the purse string holders it is one of the crucial factors. And I think often internally, in terms of our work, where we've worked with some local authorities directly, there's a challenge for them internally to articulate why this matters more than just for social care. And there's a real kind of cross-departmental outcomes argument that I think I think we haven't made strongly enough yet, but I think that we can support others to make about care as a kind of foundational infrastructure. You know, it's not an extractive cost. It is employment. It is support to people. And it is part of the foundational infrastructure. There was, you'll all be aware of the Women's Budget Group research I'm sure around around the kind of additional impact of investing in care over investing in building roads I probably oversimplified that massively um but yeah the kind of the shared outcomes locally and this the kind of ripple effect that that working with and supporting the development of cooperative and collectively owned models of, of social care can have around kind of economic growth local spending as we've talked about the environmental impact Kind of communities, employment, and then then there's the kind of the additional ripple effect around prevention and health and how how we talk to other departments and cross sector around why this stuff is important because I think that's where the additional support financially, but also in terms of kind of small p political support, will come from for greater greater kind of numbers of these models. I'm not going to talk about it in depth, partly because I'm not an expert in it, but I think kind of a lot of these models really fit with donut economics. And I know some of you are really aware of it, um, but about this kind of how can we provide the social foundation without going over the ecological ceiling? And one of the things for me around collective and cooperative owned social care, particularly at a local level, is it really fits within that, as long as it's obviously delivered well and has the right ethos, which they tend to do. But yeah, and I think that, that for me, and particularly, you know, we've got COP26 coming up, there's a lot of the environmental, the environmental issues and the push for net zero is coming. And I think collectively, we can make a bigger argument about the role of locally, cooperatively, collectively owned social care in that space, in terms of reducing carbon footprint. Um, I was going to talk about Equal Care Co-op, but you're speaking to Emma later, so I'll let her talk about it. Uh, but we have supported Equal Care Co-op um, as well. So I'm coming to the end of my quick rattle through in terms of what my, I guess my kind of, my excitement about these models as much as anything. And I wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the support available, investment market shaping, and looking at my next slide, I've just realised one for some reason hasn't shaved, so I'm just going to stop here and keep talking about it. Um, so in terms of support available, um, we have traditionally as an organisation been quite a kind of big grant funder. And with our strategy change, we are going to be less of a big grant funder. And um, so we have supported a lot of organisations, but that doesn't mean there isn't options for support. So there are grant funds available. Um, we are going through processes of working out what we might provide, but there are other grant funds around that could support this. I think one of the one of the major challenges is there isn't a central funder and or infrastructure organisation for the supporting the development of these things. Um, so there is no one central place that is is the kind of the social collective cooperative social care development center where all of this knowledge is pulled and I think you know that is that is a challenge that we're aware of um, that said you know the, there are opportunities uh, as Palm Valley and Equal Care Co-op have, have done there's, there's community share offers that can, can be raised there's crowdfunding um, there is potential I think for work in social investment but it has to be on the right terms and it has to be patient capital 
Um, yeah, and it has to be really on the right terms. And I think, you know, we, it is one of the major challenges is where does, where does the investment come from? Because from work we've done with some specific local authorities, it's really clear that you need culture change in a local authority in order to, to really invest in kind of financially, but also in terms of person time and changing attitudes if we're going to get this as an embedded and respected approach to social care. But you also need to invest in organisations either to shift their model, if they're already delivering but in a different way, to shift their model or to set up. So you might have, as Prom Valley, setting up a whole new organisation, or you might have a community hub that says, actually, we think we could deliver good care by employing people on our estate, for instance, to provide care to other people on our estate, rather than those people going off to 40 minutes away to deliver 15 minute care that they don't really want to be delivering because they want to be delivering longer term good care to people, but that's the job they have. Actually, could we employ them on the estate to look after the people on our estate who are in need of support, who are already receiving support, but it's the same kind of not great care? And, and could we do that? So you, how do we support organisations to either start in this space or or to yeah, shift their model slightly and, and develop into it. So I think there's, there are opportunities, but from local authority and in, investors' perspective, it needs, it needs time, um, it, needs, it needs money. So these are kind of some of our learnings from recent work is you know, market shaping is a Care Act responsibility for local authorities. They need to do it. Um, but yeah, how, how do we create the environment for them where they understand and it, it's, it isn't feeling quite so risky? Because it probably does feel quite risky, you know. And I, I know that you at Con Valley have had quite a lot of support from Kirklees, and that's fantastic. I don't know in other places, local authorities have been really supportive of organisations and and kind of big shifts. So I think there's there are opportunities, and I'm not meaning to sound really kind of doomy gloomy and that there's nothing there because there there are opportunities and there is investment, and there is excitement about this stuff. I think it's starting to starting to build some momentum, and I think things like this are really crucial for that because it provides a bit of a kind of blueprint for people to go, okay, fine, we've got all this learning and you know, that mutual learning, and we can add to that learning as we go. And I think that's really exciting. Uh, and it, But if we want to get to kind of that level of delivery across the country, then we need to support local authorities as well to make that change. And I think that's one of the really kind of interesting reflections is we could end up with a lot of, a lot of individual great organisations doing fantastic work, but to get to a shift change, and I think that's why we were really keen to support this work with Con Valley, um, is we need to document things and make it easier for people to, to develop their own organisations, but also to have those conversations with their local authorities. Um, I'm going to stop there. I think I've rattled through that quite quickly. So sorry, if, <laughs> but open for kind of discussions, conversations, questions, anything like that. I'll just stop my screen share. Oh, thank you, Susie. That was great. And we've had more people joining. So hopefully you've sort of managed to capture most of that. I'm looking at chat. There's no sort of questions there just now, but we already have a hand raised. Graham's back on the call, which is great. Do you want to go? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Veronica. Sorry, my internet fell over earlier, but we're back online now. Um, yeah, hi, hi Susie. I, I'm interested to uh, find out more about what your thoughts are about engaging with local authorities on these issues and whether there's, I mean, obviously, um, you know, Power to Change have been active right across the country, so you've got lots of experience. I'm interested to see if there's any sort of strategy about that or, um, or whether you're just sort of doing it on a piecemeal basis. Um. Being perfectly honest, we've kind of gone where the energy is. So our original time frame as an organisation was to be in existence until the end of 2022. And we started in 2015. So it was a pretty quick time frame to yeah. spend quite a large endowment, but also have impact. Obviously, you don't just want to spend it, you want to have the impact with it. So a lot of our, a lot of our work was going where there was already a kind of certain level of energy, interest and development of kind of community business. So we've worked quite extensively in the Liverpool City region, in Bristol, um, 
Yeah. Um, so I th- there is a kind of, if the door is a little bit open, push on it. Um, I don't think we've quite worked out what to do if there's, if the door isn't open at all. So this, I'm not, I'm not sure how to get into that. I think we've done some work with Bristol specifically around, um, and it, it's still in development, but hopefully we'll have more to say soon around um, how can they invest in some community businesses to add social care into their delivery models so that they can gradually start to shift provision across the city to a more locally rooted approach. Um, and that's, you know, they are starting to get to set up and that has been a long time. And I think that that's also one of the things that we have to recognise is it takes a long time. Um, and I think it, it's, it's difficult to say this, but I think us coming in to support that made it easier for the community businesses to have that conversation with the council, because I think, you know, we, we were coming and we, we didn't put the investment in, we put investment into some specialist support. So I think that is one of the other crucial things that the council put the funding into the organisations. I think we were really keen that the council owned that bit of it because yeah. they need to in order to shift. To shift. I think the other ways we've done it, so we worked with community catalysts who I know you have talked to, are talking to um, in a couple of places. So I think those kind of, those intermediary organisations that can support a local authority to to do that bit of culture change can be really helpful. But again, it really, if it's needed, there might be some councils where it's just not needed and they're cracking on, that's fantastic. Um, but I, yeah, I, it's very hard to know what to do about councils that are not interested at all in different ways of doing it. But I feel like the pressure is probably mounting to start to do things differently. Yeah. Um, and I think if we can if we can make a case, particularly around the kind of local economies and around the environmental thing, it starts to become a bigger thing than social care as a. And I think this oh, is yeah. this is one of. The, that I kind of get frustrated about is, you know, social care is, is a drain on the economy and it's just not. And I think, you know, if we can start to connect up all those different arguments quite kind of um, and make a really, a really articulate case for them, which I'm not doing right now, um, then, then we might start to shift some thinking and you might start to get broader local authority buy-in into a seemingly small social care thing. Yeah, that's great. I guess, uh, and just sort of, holding up examples um, in front of local authorities and saying, you know, look what's happening over here. You could, you could have some of this sort of thing. Yeah, and that's why we did the bit of work in Bristol and the bits with community catalysts and things, so you can start to kind of, and it's a bit too simple, but start to kind of de-risk it for other places. Yeah. It, it is actually possible. Yes, it takes time. Here's the learning from it, and it'll be different where you are, but this is where we've got to. Mm. Great. Thanks for that. No worries, thanks, Brian. I think, Brian, you've got your hand up as well, I think. Yeah, hello. Um, it's very interesting, uh, Susie, what you had to say. Um, so I am a member of the Eden Care Co-op in uh, West London, on the borough of Eden, and uh, our local authority is, is uh, very supportive. Uh, their, their initiative, really, that, that got us going. They sent out a circular to everybody on direct payments, and... Um, that, that, that's how it started and um, we're actually having a meeting uh, next week with the head of um, social services who are interested to see how we're getting on and um, also we've got um, three Labour MPs in um, Ealing and uh, one of them is um, uh, a member of the um, uh, Labour and Co- Cooperative Party at James Murray. He was at one time on the um, select committee um the um, they call it the health and social uh, services uh, committee in in Parliament. So um, and we've also got some um, SGAG. That's a sort of like a pressure group, the Union Social Care um, Action Group. And uh, James Murray meets with them. So um, yeah, I wanted to ask too is the um, where, where where Power to Change get their funding from? Because obviously we're interested in maybe applying for a grant. Um, to help us uh, move on to the next stage. And um, yeah. yeah, so, um, <laughs> so we it. got our initial endowment from what was the Big Lottery Fund, is now National Lottery Community Foundation. 
Um, so we got that back in 2015. And then we just sec secured some additional funding from them in order to continue our lifespan. So we decided, as I mentioned, you know, we were due to close at the end of 2022. And when the pandemic hit, we felt like it wasn't appropriate because we wouldn't be there to support community business to kind of thrive after the pandemic. And um, we'd probably be closing at exactly the moment they needed us most. So we, we, yeah, we kind of restructured, we thought about our strategy again, and we went back to the lottery and had conversations with them to get some additional funding, which was successful, which is great. Um, so now we're around to at least 2025. So yeah, that's, that's our main source of funding at the minute. Um, so yeah, we at the minute don't have any kind of big grant funds, but we are still doing a few of our, I can send a link through to, I'll put it into the chat of what is available for our, for our funding at the minute. Okay, yes. And um, the other thing I meant to say was that um, we are um, in co close collaboration with Equal Care and uh, Cone Valley, and um, we're learning from other co ops who are a bit further advanced than us. And uh, we, we obviously are going to work in local circles. Um, Eden right. is a very large borough. Uh, we don't want to be whizzing about all over the place. Um, so we're, going to, we're doing the local circle things. So, um, yeah, it all sounds very good. Thank that you. That sounds really exciting, Graham. Yeah, it will be. <laughs> it is, it will be. Great. Thanks, Thank you. Angela had her hand up for a little bit. Have you changed your mind? Have we answered your question already? Um, well, yeah, I guess what I wanted to say, because I'm involved with uh, uh, co-housing and, you know, kind of community-led housing, but specifically co-housing. And obviously, um we end up sort of like with that frustrating place, you know, where lots of the local authorities don't recognise, you know, uh, they've got different departments for housing, health and social care. And obviously these are, you know, uh, let's say, you know, using co-housing as, as an example, there's really a bit of an intersection between between those things, because if you're setting up a co-housing community, you're already determining that you want to be mutually supportive of one another. You may not be uh, agreeing, uh, you know, to, to offer complex care needs, but it, it's very much um, a benefit to the social care sector. And um, and I was just kind of thinking in my area where, you know, which is Kent, you know, we've got a two tier um, authorities and Kent County Council is responsible for social care for the whole of the county. So it just seemed to me, because I'm not really, you know, I, I'm interested in this space, but I'm not very, you know, really knowledgeable about your whole cooperative care, which is why I'm kind of listening, because it's really, really interesting to see how those things, there's so much similarity um, in, in things that we're trying to achieve from the care perspective, but we sort of adding the housing in as, a, as being the resource, you know, um, to be able to provide that. But I just wondered if there's, you know, from all the knowledge on here, and obviously that great presentation, which I've kind of taken stuff from, you know, if there's a way of of really sort of presenting this this idea at, at the two tier that the two tier level, because then you've only really sort of almost got to get one person or one department to really um, think about a policy that can then uh, filter through into a much wider area and be a greater opportunity to to more you know groups that are wanting to do something like that. And there are a lot of co-ops in, in Kent as well. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I don't really know what I'm asking. I'm kind of throwing something out there and just saying, <laughs> any thoughts? <laughs> I think it's, yeah. It's, and I think this is one of the real challenges is kind of, and particularly, as you say, we've done quite a lot of work around community-led housing as well yeah, um, yeah. and kind of health and yeah. community-led housing and things. So there's, there's a lot in there. Um, and it is hard. And I think one of the things that is sometimes, and I don't know if Kent has this kind of across the tiers, but if, if there's a kind of collective vision, so sometimes a council or, or two tier authorities will develop this kind of collective vision for the place. And I, I, I don't know if this will work, but it's the kind of how you link what it is you're doing to their outcomes, I think, mm -hmm. and what they're trying to achieve. Um, so I think kind of some of the work we've done in Liverpool City Region, you know, they want to have a bigger social economy. So that's quite an easy thing for us to go in and go, oh, cool. Well, we can we can talk to you a lot about this, um, which is great. Um, but if, yeah, I think it is really tricky. Sometimes it is just about an individual. If you find the right person who 
is kind of keen, interested, and has the kind of right level of seniority, then you, you can get a lot done. Um, and that, that is sometimes really hard unless, unless as a group, someone knows someone somewhere. So it, it, relationships are so crucial to this kind of thing, that building those really strong relationships with the right people, which is why it takes such a long time, I think, as well, to, to really achieve the kind of impact that we want to achieve. So I don't, yeah, I don't think there's a, there's a kind of hard and fast or hard and easy way to do it. Yeah. But I mean, from the, the power to change perspective, obviously, you've got all those slides and you've done some research and stuff already. Is there any, you know, assistance as such? Or is there, a, like you said, that there's sort of a gap in the, pro is there a sort of a gap in, in, in provision that might be able to be filled by, you know, others sort of petitioning or, um, in this, in, in this area? Yeah, I mean, I think, as I said, the social care bit, I think there is a gap around that kind of having an infrastructure organisation. So, you know, you've obviously got the National Community Led Housing Trust that is there and supports yeah. supports and kind of, across and then you might have low, kind of more local or regional hubs for that. And I think in social care, there isn't that kind of national infrastructure to support mm -hmm. kind of community led models of care, mm -hmm. um, which um, someone might contest me on that, but to invest in them as well. Um, and I think that's that's one of the gaps that we've identified and you know, we, we will continue to explore that. Um, we can't do that alone because we are just there for community business. But yeah, so I think there's there are gaps in that kind of national level. level. And I think there's, there is a thing to potentially kind of around local research um, that can be done to identify gaps locally. And all the data should be available. Mm -hmm. The data should be publicly available, and if it's not, you should be able to ask access to the data around kind of what is the level of service, what is the level of, of kind of demand, what types of support are, are required where to then kind of make the case. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've got a couple in the chat. Veronica, what have you, you asked something? Um, well, about. Sue's got her hand up, so maybe Sue's oh, okay. going to Sue, first, sorry, and then let's come back to chat. Sorry, yeah. Um, just um, on the on the housing issue, it, it strikes me. I only know Kirk Lee's well, but but um, there's there's quite a lack of join up at a practical level between housing and social care in the local authority. Um, I I think there's there's a join up between the um, the local housing organisation, which is the arms land, you know, used to be council housing. There's some join up there, but I think in terms of other housing providers, and I don't know any co-housing stuff that's going on in Kirklees, there isn't a, a join up. And, and I'm wondering if, you know, actually, if there isn't that join up at, a, at an infrastructure level, whether creating something that allows... Um, that supports the local authority to see a joined up approach between local, you know, um, social housing and co-housing and providers of social care. Because often what happens is that the, the, um, the join up is at a commissioning level, which you need, but actually unless you join it up at a provision level, then you, you know, they, they, can't, they can't commission something that doesn't exist and we could make it simpler by joining those two things together, or, or partnering um, with a with a with a um, like-minded organisation. Um, and I, it's made me think perhaps we as a co-op need to find out what's going on housing-wise in in our local area. Sorry, that was a bit of a waffle. No, but I think it's a really really valid point. You know, I, I'm talking a lot about local authorities, but there's a lot that can kind of crack on with <laughs> and then come to the local authority with, we, we know because we've spoken to these people over here that there is a need here or there is an asset here that we could work with. How are we going to do this collectively as opposed to kind of asking them, yeah, asking the local authority to give you everything. So I think it is a really valid point, kind of what, without taking on burdens and burdens of work, what are those connections that you can make on the ground then make the case even stronger yeah thank 
we... we chat. Sorry, I was just going to say we just had some chat. Yeah, yeah. On that question around seeing what other adult services departments are currently doing. So I think Mervyn and I both said ADAS, so the Association of Directors of Adult Social Care, and they have regional ones. Um, and there's a few that are doing some pretty good work around that, which are, I think, kind of particularly around the, the economic value of it. Um, so West Midlands and the Northwest are doing some really strong work around kind of the economic value of care in that as well, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, and TLAP do quite a bit around what people are doing as well. Veronica, you asked a question about climate emergency or something. There was, yeah, there was a point from Jan who's uh, had to go now around climate emergency work uh, as an inroad to local authorities. So has there been anything part of change has been have been have you been using the avenue or have you um not not in relation to social care as yet we haven't really been doing that but i mean broadly yes we've had we've had some kind of big big funding programs around climate emergency and renewable energy so core which is community owned renewable energy program where we effectively bought up solar farms in partnership with others not on our own and um, bought up solar farms from private developers uh, and then over time we'll sell them back to community organisations once they're up and ready to do it. So put them through capacity support, which is, is really exciting. Um, and then um, our community energy programme, which is about kind of supporting community organisations that want to do kind of cool new things. So it might be developer batteries. I can, I can put some links in. But it's the climate emergency is one of our, so we've got some kind of themes running through our new work and it is absolutely central to our new work kind of crucially uh, at the very heart of what we do kind of we've got new and diverse audiences climate emergency so it is really really central to what we are focusing on going forward I just, I think, uh, oh, yeah, I just got a question that there was some stuff in the chat about the uh, cooperative council's innovation network and I'm, I'm sure that you're well aware so I just wondered if there's any Sort of uh, linkage happening there at a sort of a strategic level with the uh, power to change. Yeah, definitely. We talk to them quite a lot, and I mean we're an affiliate member um, of it, and we are. I just actually had an email last a couple of days ago about some piece. Of that, um, I can't remember what it was, but yeah, about about kind of social care in particular. So yeah, I think there's there is a really growing interest, particularly across that network. Um, Obviously, I think, but I, yeah, I think there is a real opportunity to kind of push learning out through that network, which can kind of raise the profile of it. Um, Duncan. Um, yes, sorry. Uh, just talking about network interest, uh, we have a situation down here in uh, Bath where um, a residential home is going to be closed. Uh, and it means, of course, of quite a lot of disruption, especially to the non-mobile members of the residential um, home. And what we're hoping to do is to make an intervention on behalf of both the Alliance and, the, and possibly the party to see if it's possible to be able to prevent the closure because it's owned by a charity and not by... Um, a corporate firm and see whether it's possible to run it as a cooperative. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, work to be done here. And I was wondering if it's possible to ask people here if they have any information at all about whether, in fact, a care home is being run by a cooperative. By a cooperative. And also, is most of the social care that you're talking about domestic rather than residential? I can jump in on the fact I don't know of a residential home that is owned cooperatively or collectively. Others might. Um, and I think kind of we've predominantly been talking about domiciliary, but I don't think that makes residential kind of not relevant in this context. I think absolutely. I mean, it sounds like a really kind of stressful situation, really potentially really traumatic so I think it, yeah in in that situation yes, it is. It's, it's, yeah it's traumatic for staff and for um and for the uh residents uh but what we want to try and do is to see if there's some kind of way in which we can prevent this closure which has been occasioned by 
economic problems and that basically it's a the building is grade two um, listed and therefore we can't modify it, we can't change it or, or, or adapt it to be able to increase the number of uh, residents to cover the shortfall that currently exists and has probably existed for about a year. Mm. So um, some of them will be moved to uh, a home run by other people of, of, with this, from the same charity. That only applies to about 10 people who are the mobile ones. People with Alzheimer's, people who are in fact more seriously affected uh, will have to be physically moved to another home. And for both families and for the residents, it's traumatic. But I don't want to be melodramatic. I'm just looking for information. You know, is there anybody who knows anything about the possibility of a residential home being run on cooperative lines? That's really what I'm asking. I, I don't, personally. Does anyone else on the call have any, any thoughts about it? I don't think it's impossible, though. I thought Mark had his hand up there. Uh, what springs to mind is um, the question of do you know who actually owns the property? Is it privately owned or is it actually authority owned? It's privately owned by a charity that owns these two homes. That's the reason why we're making the app. Okay. Because okay. Um, being a charity, the last thing they want to do is to close it down, and therefore they are, I think, interested in hearing from any group that might be able to help. And what I'm looking for, of course, is some information about um, whether such things have been tried before. I've done a survey of situation in Holland and other things like that, you know. Um, Thank you, what is the Sorry. There might have been problems with the CQC. I'm looking into that, just in terms of your uh, um, comment that you've made in the in the chat. But what I'm looking for are models, maybe something that perhaps has some had some indication of success, or possibly forming an alliance with some other group, another charity, perhaps something. That could also help. What is, what is the reason, Duncan, they given for closure? Is it a question of economics? Yeah, although a charity, it has to stay within the 10% or so that makes it viable. Therefore, although it's not, although it's um, non-profit, nonetheless, it is um, operating at a loss as far as its viability is concerned. Do you know whether that's an occupancy scenario or is it a um, income generating scenario? I think that there's probably um, scope for increasing its income, but unfortunately it's blocked by the fact that it's a listed property, grade two, and therefore they can't make the adaptations needed to be able to extend it in such a way as to as to increase the number of um, residents. Uh, but that doesn't mean to say that you couldn't shift to another building. It all depends very much on, I mean, there are outlying buildings which apparently are affected by the same difficulty that are being listed. But I mean, we could make an application and say, involving the council, which unfortunately is Lib Dem, uh, Though we do have the support, of course, of our Labour councillors within, you know, who are in the minority, um, that perhaps they could, you know, the move could be less traumatic uh, to another local residential uh, placement. But my question is only that has it ever been tried? Has anybody ever done this, really? Uh, all I know, Duncan, um, maybe everybody else is aware, I'm not sure, 
But there is um, obviously this liability that rests with the council that when this scenario presents itself, they have a duty of care. Um, and unfortunately, I believe in the past, that's meant that um, all the occupants have been dispersed to other homes and other areas. And that's obviously what you wish to avoid, I would have thought. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the council has been involved. The, um, you know, the uh, staff, council staff have visited the place and made the usual, uh, and made the usual gestures as far as, uh, um, you know, investigating is concerned. I, uh, I just feel that there's a scope here for a cooperative situation. I don't know, for example, whether the staff have a, whether there's any union reps amongst the staff. That would be a very useful thing to know. But anyway, that was my question. And thank you very much, Mark, for your, um, for your, for your advice there. Um, we are continuing to investigate. We had a working party looking into this, but we found constantly that the immense costs involved were almost prohibitive as far as yeah. Yeah. The problem that you're having to deal with is, I guess you, you're aware, Duncan, is that um, we have to tell it the way it is, although um, our hearts go out to people that um, get involved in this kind of scenario. And although your building is being run by a charity, we're all bound by the same rules that if there's not enough income to cover the expenditure and you cannot generate sufficient, then it's a, it's a bit of a no-win situation. And I'm just trying to think ahead how a cooperative in your situation it's going to give you what you need. Um, you know, the charitable status is probably your strongest ally in as much as um, they need to find a way to generate um, the, the additional income that's needed to support your situation, which you don't see from what you said is has been able to change because it's a listed building. Yeah, okay, yeah. Well, thanks yep. again for your advice there. Um, we're aware of the, the tragic scenario. What Duncan, can I, I'm really, I'm really sorry. I'm just wondering whether maybe we step in with asking Angela if there is a way of maybe you having the conversation together outside of the call as well, so that we're actually able to offer something more practical because Susie did say we're not aware of anything. Sue had a really good point about the building, <coughs> uh, uh, about what the regulations connected limitations might be. And I just wonder whether we're the most helpful platform at this point. Angela, do you have anything to add at this stage? Do you have any ideas from what you've heard so far? Um, I'm afraid I didn't hear all of it because I had to move away right at the beginning. So rather than like uh, repeating it all, I'm very happy. I put my email in the chat. Um, I'm, you know, more than happy to kind of have a look at it and see if there's any uh, further, you know, further suggestions. So um, if Duncan would like to do that. Yeah, OK. As I said, I was only making inquiries, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Duncan. And sorry to sort of step in. Let's just see if we can bring it back to a bit more widely also so that we, yeah, so that we're able to support you well as well. It doesn't sound like we've got the knowledge in the room right now to be able oh, well, thanks to again. do that. Great, thank you. Uh, is there anything, uh, we've got something from Lionel in the chat as well. There was a point briefly mentioned yesterday uh, and we're wondering whether Susie's got anything to that. Our local authorities under pressure not to give unfair support to new social care co-ops or enterprises for fair competition reasons. You can see that, Susie, yourself. Thank you. Um, hmm. uh, I, it's very hard to say. I think s there might be a perceived feeling that that pressure is there and that might 
It might be a real feeling for some people working in local authorities as well. They might feel like they can't do that because they're constantly being told about the fairness rules. Um, and having talked to procurement people and commissioners, it, it is possible um, to do that. And they have a market shaping responsibility um, and how it aligns with that broader, I think, as I was saying before about that, how it aligns with the broader kind of overall plans of the council. So if a council has a kind of local and uh, inclusive local economies argument, if, if that's its, its vision is to have an inclusive local economy, less extractive economy, um, to have decrease its you know, work towards net zero by 2030 or, or whatever its personal kind of goals are as, as a local authority, it is then can cascade from that. So that, that opens up those avenues. Um, so yeah, it, it, I'm not in any way saying that individual kind of officers in councils don't feel that as a real feeling. I think that is absolutely valid and I think a lot of them do. But I think that there are way, not ways around it and kind of trying to hide things, but that there are ways that actually open that up and reduce that pressure of it being around how you contributing through this to achieving the goals of the local authority and its, its strategy or vision. Is there anything else from anyone? Anything else that anyone put in the chat which we've not really addressed anyone it doesn't feel I just wanted to say thanks um Sergio yeah, it's really um interesting session and informative thanks Graham thanks for having me it's been really useful to see the uh, the vision and the priorities as they've changed, Susie, as well, because we've got being the grant being one of the grantees, we've had the communication as well, but it's always a useful reminder because it's yeah, anytime, anytime that it changes, it's also useful to sort of understand where the current project and when whatever's sort of happening next is fitting in. So it's really good to hear from that we're with the despite shifting priorities that we're still very much fitting in with whatever the vision has been so that's very good yeah and i think i do think the the net zero argument is a real opportunity for this stuff and i think that there's a kind of onus on us and others to work up work up that argument because you know the onus shouldn't be on individual organizations to necessarily do that um obviously if they can great um but I think there is a broader onus, onus to work up kind of some of those arguments around local economies, around fairer economies and around the climate emergency. Had her hand up as well. Do you want to add anything? I was just going to say I've taken an enormous amount from that. Um, I feel like I was a bit, I, I haven't quite clocked the wider arguments we can make with the local authority about that. You know, um, sometimes you can't see past the procurement rules. And that actually um, tagging on to, I know that Kirk Lees is really keen on the whole um, climate emergency thing, and that actually um, lodging ourselves within that argument, I think will will um, will help us to work better in partnership with the local authority. So thanks for that. It's been ever so helpful. Hey, oh, oh, sorry. Can, can, I, I, can I come in? Hello. Yeah, go on, Chris. Yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, thank you. So, so, sorry, I'm late and, and missed most of your uh, presentation, Susie. Um, Chris Cook, I'm a senior research fellow at the Institute for Strategy, Resilience and Security at U UCL. Um, my principal interest has been in energy. So net zero, my ears pricked up immediately because that's my sort of prime interest. But um, what I've been working on for the best part of a decade is you could call it blended finance, uh, public, private, philanthropic, how to bring them together uh, sort of seamlessly. <clears throat> um, sort of, I think of the word mutualization. So it's, it's, it doesn't fall as private or public. It's, it's bringing together sort of new institutions, if you like, institutions as agreements rather than organizations. We think there's enough organizations as it is. What is needed is 
cooperate, you know, cooperation, risk sharing, cost sharing, surplus sharing between organisations. And there are, th there are, are in our view, <clears throat> th this is primarily focused on net zero and the transition to a low carbon economy. And, and we completely agree that the, the COVID <clears throat> shock, I think we could call it that, um, has precipitated changes that would otherwise have taken a long time and is, is, is bringing people's attention to the fact that we can't return to normal. There is no return to normal here. Um, but it does open up, I think, entirely new possibilities um, for a resilient economy. And of course, resilience is bottom up. So my focus is very much on how communities can um, mobilize resources at local level. Um, I, I'm, I'm working with Graham on an initiative, <clears throat> a separate initiative involving mutual credit. He's, he has an interest in that. And that was sort of stimulating my interest in joining this conversation. So thanks for bearing with me. Uh, anything I can do uh, to sort of um, assist or bring some new ideas and options to the table, that's why I'm here. So I just thought I'd introduce myself. Thank you. <clears throat> Great to meet you, Chris. I might chuck my email in the chat for anyone, but if, yeah, it'd be good to pick up with you as well afterwards. Yeah. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, I mean, unless, yeah, thank you very much. That's been really great, Susie, and thanks for all the questions. I mean, unless people have stuff to still ask, we'll, we've got another session starting at half past 10 with Change Agent. So we're able to just stop the recording for now. Uh, and if people want to sort of stay around and chat before this other session starts, that'll be, that'll be great. And then, yeah, unless there's anything else, we'll just thanks very much to Susie for joining us and, uh, been so supportive of what we've been doing because it's been it's been amazing having the flexibility and having the understanding of us being really small and really tiny and hopefully mighty and trying to do things yeah in a in sort of everything that's been happening over the last two years well year and a half two years really so yeah that's been brilliant to have such a supported supportive funder uh, and grant manager and a person to sort of know to go to if we uh, if we need it so thank you. Well, thank you all. Thanks for having me and see you soon.